السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ وکفا السلام علیہ عباد الزین اصطفا اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم فتکرونی اذکرکم وشکرو لی ولا تکفرون سبحان ربی کا رب العزت عما یصیفون السلام علی المرسلین والحمد للہ رب العالمین اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم We we'll begin today's majlis with the beautiful name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send salutations on his beloved and our master Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows our coming together to read about the beautiful sayings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be a source of redemption and a source of forgiveness for each and every one of us. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like He has blessed us with this companionship in this dunya, blesses us with a companionship in akhirah, which is a better companionship in the, in the gardens of Jannah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our shortcomings. The heart seems sad because a great friend is departing, is leaving us a friend that has been with us for 30 days. And this gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Ramadan, truly, truly, it has been an incredible time for each and every one of us, a time of transformation, a time of reflection, contemplation, and really a chance to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask that this last lesson that we are having today inshallah ta'ala um, becomes again uh, a basharat and announcement of of our forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala please remain attentive towards your hearts and make sure that your hearts are attentive towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today's first hadith in mubarakah has been narrated by wathila Ibn al Asqa anhu, and he related that Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one of the greatest fabrications is for a person to attribute himself to someone other than his own father. In other words, he, she is the son, daughter of someone, but claims to be that of someone else. For example, it is the habit of some people to claim that they are Sayyids, you know, from the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when in actual fact they're not. Or he claims to have seen something which he did not really see. Right? For example, saying that a person sees false dreams or false visions. Or he attributes something to Rasulullah wasallam which he did not say. And this is a hadith that has been related by Imam Bukhari rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi. So as you can say that, see that there are several lessons to be learned here. Number one, um, attributing um, that a person has like a, a nisbah with somebody, attributing themselves to somebody other than their own father. Right? Even though our masters are like our spiritual parents, in reality, the, our true parents are just that, our true parents. And when it comes to their khidmah, their service, and treating them with excellence, it is really the Quran talks about the true parents, and you know our masters are are, are murshid, murshidin and and they are there for our guidance, and so we treat them with respect. But all the rights of the parents are only for the parents themselves. And second, we have to understand that um, this hadith talks about people claiming false claims to unveilings to mukashifat. And the Hadith of Mubarakah is obviously telling us that it is a major sin. Unfortunately, many of those who make such claims are actually doing so falsely and are guilty of committing a sin. They will make claims that they have dreams about Rasulullah that they have seen Nabi Wasallam countless times, and in a special kind of uh, information has been given to them. And so all of that... Um, is obviously unverifiable and a lot of times it is untrue as well. So people making claims like that should be afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will be held accountable 
on the Day of Judgment. Also, carelessness in narrating hadith from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That one may be excused if when quoting a hadith, one assumes that the narrator um, from whom the hadith was related was not mistaken, even though the narrator was mistaken. But in their letters and writings, certain spiritual masters have used this license to include, whether intentionally or not, baseless hadith, which they're called mawlu. Mawlu are fabricated hadiths. So it is a sin. It is a sin and it should be avoided. If, however, after being informed by legitimate scholars of hadith that the hadiths have been quoted are spurious and uh, the masters persist in quoting such narrations, as is the way of many ignorant Sufis, there can be no excuses and this is a sin in itself and it should be avoided. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah ta'ala has given us, you know, teachers who will always keep us in check and make sure that, you know, we stay on the right path and make sure that, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we do not become people of excess. Okay? The next hadith in Mubarakah has been narrated by Isa ibn Waqid and he relates that Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa said that when the year 180 arrives I permit my ummah to abstain from marriage and to resort to living a solitary, li solitary life on the mountaintops and <clears throat> this has been narrated by Razin um, Now, abstaining from marriage and living in solitude, right? this is celibacy. Some spiritual masters opted for this in order to avoid internal and external temptations and are known to have adopted these means. Right? The hadith here clearly permits this in such circumstances. Um, the year is named in order to make reference to this very situation of temptation because it was a time of many temptations. Um, now, if a person is not distracted and if a person is able to fulfill the rights, then of course this is the sunnah of Rasulullah and they should adopt it and get married. Especially nowadays, it has almost become wajib that a person should get married because there are so many temptations around people and becomes extremely, ex uh, almost impossible for people to control their nafus. Okay? But, you know, as, as we say that every nafs is different, for some reason, for some people, this may not be a need. And, you know, they may find that getting married um, has become like a source of um, distraction for them. Then, you know, they can be excused um, and they can seek out solitude if that, you know, suits their lifestyle as well. Okay? The next hadith of Mubarakah has been narrated by Hazrat Anas Razila Anhu. He says that a man said to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Should I tie my camel and place my trust in Allah? Or untie it and place my trust in Allah? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, Tie it and place your trust in Allah. Okay, This was related by Imam Tirmazi Rahmatullah. A very important hadith that tells us that resorting to means does not negate placing one's trust in Allah. Because some people misunderstand what tawakkul means. Oh, that I'm depending on Allah, I'm relying on Allah, does that mean that I don't make my own effort? No. Putting our own effort, of course, is like tying the camel. But our reliance in tawakkul is always in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Meaning we don't look at our own mihna as the source of the result, but we look at the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it doesn't mean that you stop making the effort. Right? So abandoning the means is not necessarily necessary for tabakkul. This hadith in Mubarakah is clear in this regard. It is not permitted to abandon certain means for all people. Right? Well, certain means may not be abandoned by the weak hearted, right? At all. Like they should not abandon it at all. We covered this a little bit when we're talking about risk, right? That 
you know you make the effort and then you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah ta'ala is the raziq okay Allahu Akbar Kabira. so I hope inshallah ta'ala that it is clear the next hadith in Mubarakah Ibn Abi Kathir related that Abu Sahim who said <coughs> that a woman passed by me in the street and I brushed against her being overcome by lust. However, I immediately took my hand away out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next day Rasulullah was accepting pledges of allegiance bay'ah from people and I too went to him for the same purpose. He said to me, are you not the one who touched that woman yesterday? And I replied, indeed, O Messenger of Allah وسلم, but I will never do that again. Nabi وسلم, that took the Pledge of Allegiance from me. Again, a very important hadith that has been related by, uh, by Razin. Hmm? So the assumption must be made here that the woman in question was unaware of what transpired. Right? Otherwise, had harm been caused, the matter would not have been dealt with lightly. Right? In this instance, the lady neither reported the matter nor presented evidence to support a claim of wrongdoing. Right? Interfering with women is clearly a prohibited and reprehensible act. Right? The, generally speaking, the Sharia prohibits all acts. However, negligible in their own right that may lead to prohibited acts right nip the evil in the bud thus even following women about when there's no good reason to do so is prohibited it's haram in this case when Rasulullah had this extra sensory knowledge of the act it is clear that he understood as well that the woman had not been aware of the touch and had therefore not been alarmed and most importantly, Rasulullah was satisfied that the guilty party had caused harm only to himself and the man had truly repented and would never commit such an act again. Right? And finally, in the absence of either complaint or evidence, no ruling could be made against the offender. And it should also be noted that extrasensory evidence, even when presented by Rasulullah himself, cannot be considered admissible in a court of law. And Allah Ta'ala knows best about this. Right? So we should understand this back, background. Um, and so it, you know, it is the practice of some spiritual masters when they learn, either through a spiritual vision, kashf, or through evidence or information of an improper act committed by a salik, that they apprise the salik of the same for purposes of reprimanding and correcting. And if they apprise the Salik in the presence of others, they do so in vague terms so that the Salik may not be publicly embarrassed. And this hadith makes reference to all of this. However, spiritual visions or kashf or openings are not to be used or accepted as legal evidence. Okay, we must know that, understand that. So therefore, punishing the person or thinking ill of them on the basis of such visions is not permissible. You can say that I had a dream and now I'm going to hate such and such person. Okay. At times a master may be aware of a wrong committed by an aspirant and yet the master will not apprise him of it. Why? Owing to some underlying reason such as the fear that it might make the aspirant more audacious and so on. Or may make this person just run away. You know, some people are just weak. Right? And if they are called out without the proper tarbiyah that becomes a source for them to just you know just step back altogether and then you know that takes them away from a greater good okay that takes them away from a greater good the next hadith of mubarakah has been related by sayyidina umar bin khattab anhu. He related the hadith in which Ibrahim al posed certain questions to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a very famous hadith. It's called Hadith Jibra'il. Right? And one of the questions was this. Tell me what is Ihsan. Fa'akhbirni anil Ihsan. 
قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم منشن أن تعبد الله كأنك ترى فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك And this hadith mubarak has been related by Imam Muslim Tell me what is Ihsan? The literal meaning of this word is to worship in the best possible manner In other words, in a way that is devoid of ostentation and inattention Beauty with beauty with excellence, right? In short, such worship must have the qualities of sincerity, ikhlas, and presence of mind or huduri qalb. And Nabi Sassim replied, It refers to worshipping Allah as though you are seeing Him. Right? In other words, if you were to see Allah at such a time, how would you worship Him? Hmm? That is how you should worship Allah. Right? It is Inevitable that worship under such circumstances will be performed with the utmost sincerity and utmost presence of mind. That is how we're supposed to worship Allah. That is how our, our state of being is supposed to be. And if you do not see Him, the need to worship Him like that is still present because if you do not see Him, He certainly sees you. Right? And this is sufficient reason to worship him in this way, right? So the higher level is like as if you're in the state of mushahida. If Allah Ta'ala was in front of me, how would I worship my, my, my beloved, right? And even though I cannot experience that or I'm una unable to experience that mushahida, then at least knowing Alam uh, Ya'alam bi anna Allah that Allah Ta'ala is watching me. And even that should create this haiba and this muhabba that I'm being washed by my by beloved and I'm being washed by the, the majestic, right? The one in control. And so how would I change my behavior if I had that experience that I'm being watched? Right? And so as we know that this question was posed of Rasulullah was asked about essence of Iman and Islam. And so we can infer from this that apart from beliefs and outward deeds, there is something else worthy of acquiring. So other than aqidah, which is iman and outward deeds, which is Islam, the outward sharia, the fiqh, there's something else worthy of acquiring. This is relate, re referred to as ihsan. And ihsan, as explained in this hadith, is the essence of the Sufi way. This is really what we're trying to acquire, the maqam e ihsan or maqam e tazkiyah in the words of the Qur'an. And so the hadith calls it maqam e ihsan and the Qur'an refers to, to this as maqam e tazkiyah. So this hadith is very paramount in understanding of what the sabuf is all about. If somebody asks you, you just relate this hadith. This is what it's all about, that we achieve this, we try to achieve this. You know, we make a science out of this, a science of inner self, esoteric science. Right? So very important. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar. The next Hadith Mubarak has been related by Ubadah ibn Samit who call he says that while a group of his companions were around him Rasulullah said give me your pledge that you will not ascribe partners to Allah and that you will not steal this was related by Imam Bukhari the Imam Muslim right? so this is again about pledging allegiance bay'ah and this hadith clearly states that the people whose pledge he sought were companions with the Sahaba crowd. They were not describing partners to Allah. They were not doing shirk billah. And that you will not steal. They were not stealing as well. So it may be established that apart from pledging allegiance on embracing Islam, which is called Bayt Islam or Bayt Iman, and before waging jihad, which is called Bayt jihad a pledge to abstain from acts of disobedience and to adhere to acts of obedience and worship also used to be taken. This is called Bayt tawbah And this is the same pledge which is practiced by the masters. Yeah, right from there, 
disciples that they will take bay'ah, this pledge of allegiance. Right? Rejection of this practice is therefore tantamount to jahalat, ignorance. Because it is sabit from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that he took such a bay'ah from both Sahaba Kram and Sahabiyat. Okay? From both Sahaba Kram and Sahabiyat. This next Hadith of Mubarak is also very important. And it has been narrated by Fudala al-Kamil r.a. who قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المجاهد من جاهد بنفسه في طاعة الله that Fudala al-Kamil related that Nabi Sassam said that the mujahid is one who strives against his desires in order to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And this has been related by Bayhaqi. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Very important because jihad against desire is actually referred to as the jihad akbar, the greater jihad. In many of the sayings of the spiritual masters, why? Because it's very difficult to do. It's something inside, in something internal, it's something you know that tempts you, that that motivates you, that pushes you. It becomes your passion. These internal desires, so hard to resist it. And so this is established from the Hadith of Mubarakah that's read because the grammar in this expression, a mujahid is one who indicates that the speaker intends to restrict the reference to a certain kind of mujahid. And when there is nothing to indicate otherwise, the assumption is that the kind of mujahid intended is the perfect mujahid, that really that this is it. Right? And this sort of expression is well known to scholars of Arabi. So the hadith therefore means that the, a perfect mujahid is a mujahid who struggles with his or her desires. Hawa, internal desires or whims. Right? It should be obvious from the foregoing that the most perfect form of jihad is jihad against desires. Here the words perfect and greater have the same meaning. Okay, so struggling against the nafs, attaining tazkiyah nafs, is also a form of jihad. Also, doing jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also very um, meritorious, but again, um, sometimes it is easier for people to do the zahiri or external jihad, but it is so difficult to do jihad against their own nafs. Very difficult. How do we control our lust? How do we control our anger, our wrath? How do we control our rude behaviors? our bad ikhlaq, how do we control our hirs and tama, our longing and yearning for this dunya, hubba dunya, right? Love for the dunya, love for recognition, love for acknowledgement. How do we stop our hearts from yearning and, you know, what other people have and have hasad? Hmm? How do we stop the hasad, the jealousy, right? How do we stop looking down upon others? How do we stop falling in love with ourselves? This ujab, vanity. How do we protect ourselves from, from takabur, from, from arrogance and pride? Uh, that I am it, I should be listened to. Nobody else matters. How do we protect ourselves from shahan, from this you know, spite and malice towards others, negativity towards others, hmm? not giving others the benefit of doubt and hating others, this hate, that this animosity that we feel towards others. Isn't fighting against all of that, isn't that jihad akbar? Having these attributes, these raza'il in our in our nafs, do, do we think that we will enter into Jannah despite all of these ailments? No. Zalika jaza'u man tazakka That the, the Jannah is a place, is an abode for people of tazkiyah, people who have purified themselves. So if we have all of this filth within, what do you think is going to happen? Allah Ta'ala will purify us on the Day of Judgment in Jahannam. So the impurity leaves us and then inshallah Jannah is given to us. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar.
The next hadith in Mubarakah has been related by Uthman Wazila Talanho. And he says that many people from among the companions of Rasulullah became quite grieved when he passed away to the extent that some of them, some of them began experiencing whisperings. Wasawis. Allahu Akbar Kabira. You wasvisu, ba'duhum you wasvisu. That they started experiencing this wasawis and whisperings. Usman Razila said that I was also from among those people. While I was sitting down one day, Umar Razila passed by me and offered salam to me, but I did not even perceive his presence. Umar Razila who went and complained to Abu Bakr Siddiq Razila Talanhu. They both came to me and offered salam to me together. Abu Bakr who then said, Why is it that you did not reply to the salam of your brother Umar? I replied, I did not do that. Umar said, I take an oath by Allah that you did that. I said, by Allah, I did not even realize that you passed by me, nor did I know that you offered salam to me. Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Uthman is speaking the truth. It seems that some serious matter has kept you preoccupied. I said, indeed. He asked, what is the matter? I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And we did not even have the opportunity to ask him the actual basis for salvation in this religion of Islam. In other words, the Sharia specifies numerous injunctions. But what is the fundamental principle of all of this? The hadith further states that, Abu Bakr Siddiq consoled Uthman by informing him that he had posed this question to Rasulullah and Rasulullah replied that it is belief in the unicity and prophecy that Allah is one and Muhammad is his messenger. And this has been related by Imam Ahmad in Musnad of Ahmad. Allahu Akbar Kabira. He says that what is the najat? And he says that the najat is tawaffa Allahu ta'ala nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qabla an nas'alahu an najati hadha al-amr. Allahu Akbar. So whisperings do not negate perfection in the path. Can anyone doubt about the perfection of Uthman razila ta'ala anhu dhu nurayn? Yet he was the ghani. He was the generous one. He was the person of haya. Yet he experienced whisperings. Right? So it should be clear that whisperings neither negate perfection nor are they harmful to one's internal self. Right? And you know, it, they happen, but don't dwell on them. To be lost in thought about something related to religion is sometimes that occasionally happens to people. The intensity of this experience caused Uthman anhu to ignore his surroundings. This state is known as absence and obliviousness. And this hadith Mubarakah affirms the same. That you know a person can reach the level of, of just being absent in, in a state of absence. Okay, so some people will do, you know, will have that. And you know. It should be understood in light of this hadith of Mubarakah that has just been read. Allah Akbar Kabir. And you know, another thing, you know, subhanAllah, the support group that the Sahaba Kram had for each other. That some of the Sahaba Kram were grieved and they were experiencing a state, a hal, a spiritual hal. And look at, you know, this, subhanAllah, look at this anchor that Abu Bakr Sadiq became, that he became somebody around which people could gather. And he became somebody who would help and support his brothers in Islam. Allah Akbar. Umar Farooq went with him with the complaint that his salam is not being answered. And Usman Ghani anhu is opening up his heart of what is happening to him. And Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu is Khalifa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He becomes this anchor, right? This, this political anchor, this religious anchor, and the spiritual anchor around whom everybody just coalesced and gathered around. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. The next hadith of Mubarakah has been related um, by Abu Huraira Razi Allah Ta'ala Anhu. 
قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that يأتي شيطان أحدكم فيقول that شيطان comes to a person and asks من خلك كذا من خلك كذا who created this who created that حتى يقول من خلك ربك he eventually asks who created your Lord الله hmm? أكبر all these questions that these atheists are asking huh? where are they coming from they're coming from shaitan man khalaka rabbak who created your your rabb fa iza balaghu fal yasta'idh billahi wal wal yantahi who created your lord if he reaches such a state the person should seek a refuge in allah and abstain from having such thoughts right because this is a logical absurdity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond his creations, the creation of time and space. Allah ta'ala is beyond that. He is not creation himself, and he is the ultimate creator who does not need a first mover or first creation. Everything is contingent upon Allah, and Allah ta'ala is not contingent upon, uh, upon anyone. Otherwise, we will, we will have what is known as an infinite regression. Right? Then we'll say who created the one who created Allah and then who created the one who created Allah and then who created the one who created the one who created you know so it never ends. And this kind of infinitum only exists in imagination. In reality there is no such thing. okay? And so the ultimate cause of time and space, the ultimate creator of all of this, the ultimate creator of everything is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who does not have a creator himself. Okay? Allahu Akbar Kabira. And the way, and you know, we, we read a similar hadith in the past where people were with Sahaba Kram were having some wasavis. And what was the way to alleviate that? I seek refuge in Allah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan And apart from the blessedness of the supplication, it does have another secret. You know, when the person turns their attention towards Allah by seeking of refuge, this will draw their attention away from the whispering. Zikr of Allah Ta'ala gets rid of the gandagi or the stench or the filth of fikr, of bad thoughts. This is because the soul cannot turn its attention to two things at the same time. right? And so when we... The essence of this method is thus to become occupied in the remembrance of Allah. Thereafter, there will be no need to focus specific atten attention on repelling the whisperings of shaitan. But this is what shaitan does. He comes and puts these things. Oh, so who created this? Oh, who created that? Uh, who created you? And Allah? Okay, then who created Allah? So this is, you know, and we see this across, you know, atheist circles. That they try to sow seeds of doubts. Alhamdulillah, the mutakallameen, people of kalam and people of spirituality, this mashayikh, alhamdulillah, have answered not only those objections, but also ways to get rid of such wasavis from the hearts of the believers as well. Okay, alhamdulillah. The next hadith of Mubarakah is also related. Al-Qasim bin Muhammad narrated that a person asked him saying i experience a lot of doubts when offering my salah he said to him pay no attention to them and continue offering your salah in this way because even if you try to avoid such thoughts they will never be repelled even when you complete your salah you'll continue thinking to yourself that you did not complete your salah thinking that you have certainty certainly left something out you will therefore repeat your salah and still have the same doubts and completing the second salah as well. So how many times are you going to repeat your salah? It is therefore better not to even bother about such thoughts. So this is what, you know, in psychology they, they call OCD, obsessive compuls compulsive thoughts, right? OCD, and some people suffer from that, right? And it's a bad state to be. And again, so we should ignore those thoughts and we should, Turn our, our thoughts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his zikr. Right? So any kind of obsessive compulsive thoughts, obsessive compulsive disorders, where it's just like, oh, did I do this? Did I make wudu? Did my wudu break? Did I pray four rakas, three rakas, two rakas? Did I do surah in it? 
Um, you know, so all of these thoughts and recurring thoughts, it's just a sign of obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Um, and, you know, I'm not giving you like a, a clinical kind of, you know, but, you know, those are like obsessive thoughts, recurring thoughts, and, you know, we should pay no attention to this. And this narration provides another method was the person should not bother about those whisperings, not act upon them, just step back from them. So key, you know, even if those thoughts are coming, don't dwell on them, step back from them. And what we do in our case, and we focus on our hearts, and we focus on the dhikr qalbi of Allah, 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 because when we are present in that dhikr, when we are attentive towards that, the thoughts will remain at bay. Okay? And this treatment has proven to be the greatest cure. And you know this is explained in another way in uh, Lamaat and Mirqat that this whispering will not be warded off unless you complete your salah and say to Shaitan, even if I were to accept that my salah is incomplete, Allah is merciful, He will either accept it as it is or forgive me. I'm not in need of your advice. Uh, so Shaitan, oh, your your namaz was not accepted. We don't know if it, no. But if it's incomplete, Allah is merciful. And he will either accept it as it is, or inshallah, Allah Ta'ala is going to forgive me. This is between me and my Allah. <laughs> what a beautiful answer. This is between me and my Allah. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar Kabira. The next hadith in Mubarakah has been related by Uthman Razila Ta'ala Anhu. Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Nabi وسلم, said that whoever performs an ablution as I perform this ablution and then offers two rakahs of salah without talking to himself about anything in these two rakahs, his past sins, meaning minor sins, are forgiven. This has been related by Imam Bukhari rahmatullah, and Imam Muslim. Rahmatullah, ta'ala, right? And so this is again like unintentional thoughts in salah because a lot of people complain about this. They're not harmful. You know, if you dwell on them, then they, we make them harmful for ourselves. That if you just start thinking about it and jump from thought to thought to thought, this is called, you know, food for thought. That you are sitting there enjoying your thoughts. Huh? Such a such person, and this will happen, and that will happen. And, you know, we're, we're just, that's not even thoughts. That's called fantasizing, daydreaming. Right? And so most people are under the assumption that stray thoughts in Salah are harmful to one's concentration. Since the concentration is considered beyond one's control, most people ignore the matter entirely. The Hadith in Mubaraka uses the verb talking, yuhadithu, which is an act without, uh, within one's control, within one's control. So it may be inferred from this that thoughts which are knowingly brought to mind, which, you know, fantasizing, daydreaming, are harmful to one's concentration. Of course they're going to be. Of course they're going to be. So giving this up is within one's control. Just like you're bringing them, reject them. Push them out of your mind. Push them out of your heart. As for thoughts that come unintentionally and unwittingly, they are not harmful. Whether it's from shaitan's wasabis or even from our own nafs. If they're unintentional, that you're not forcing them in. You're not forcing them in. You know, they're not harmful. Paying attention to concentration and prayer is therefore necessary and also attainable. Also attainable. So, you know, this is something that we try to do. Haqiqat. Haqiqat salah. Huduri qalb. We try to attain it. We seek refuge in Allah. We do zikr of Allah. We push shaitan away. We, we say shaitan that even if you know, if you're putting doubts in my mind, it is between me and my Allah. And, you know, we, we, we take all of these steps. So deliberate, intentional thoughts are, don't come. This, you know, which I say like fantasizing thoughts because we're just daydreaming. Huh? Sheikh Chilli, you know Sheikh Chilli? Sheikh Chilli just used to make like big, big dreams about himself. Oh, this is going to happen and that is going to happen. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Hmm? That's what he used to do. He used to have like long, long thoughts like that. And, you know, it's just living living a dream life and not actualizing it. And so we do the same thing. We're praying and then, oh, 
I'm, become, I'm going to become an alim like this, then I'm going to become a mufti, then I'm going to become a sheikh, and then people are going to learn from me this way. And, and the people are doing zikr, oh, mashallah, look at my zikr, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to become a wali of Allah. And then everybody's, you know, going to call me mujaddad after time, and uh, amir shariat and nahbar tariqat and all of that, right? This, this is fantasizing. Allah Akbar. You are an abd of Allah. You're standing in front of Allah. Focus on that. So sometimes, you know, we have to be strict about it. We have to like push th things out. You know, keep our minds in check. Allah Akbar Kameera. The next Hadith Mubarak is also on a similar topic. It has been related by Uqba bin Amir Zilatala and who called Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when a person performs a perfect ablution and offers two cycles, rakah ten of salah, in such a manner that his heart and face, meaning internal and external self, are totally devoted to them, paradise most certainly awaits, meaning becomes obligatory for such a person. This has been related by Imam Muslim, rahmatullah ta'ala. Again, concentration in salah. This method is gay, so I'm pondering over the words, that his heart and face are totally devoted to them. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Muqbilan alayhima bi qalbihi wa wajhihi. Bi qalbihi wa wajhihi. What do we mean by that? Right? A cycle. You know, the words to them refers to the two cycles. A cycle is made up of several words and actions. Being devoted to a cycle therefore entails devotion to the components of the cycle. That is to the words and actions of that cycle. Right? Therefore the method of attaining a state of huzuri qalb khushu, concentration in prayer, is that the words and actions which are executed in the salah should be done with attention and intent. They should not be performed merely by rote, right? For example, when a per person verbally says, Subhanakallahumma, they should turn their attention to the fact that he is saying this with their tongue. When he says, Bihamdika, he must likewise turn their attention and intention to this. And we should continue to do this till the end of Salah. And as I said, you know, at the beginning of, of Ramadan, that give pauses, give like a second of pause between different things so once you're done with your sana before you start fatiha give a, a pause for a couple of seconds once you're done with fatiha don't rush into the surah then you give a pause of a couple of seconds okay bring your presence back into your salah that helps as well okay and in this way all their time in salah will be devoted to the act of worship Right? When one's attention is turned towards a particular thing, it cannot turn to something else. It is therefore inevitable that one's attention will not be directed to anything apart from the salah itself. And they will have achieved complete presence of heart. Some people will focus on one of their lataif and then you know make sure that the latifah is focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the salah, and you can do that too. The word wajhihi, in you know, face makes reference to the fact that the preoccupation with the limbs has the effect of keeping the heart preoccupied as well. So controlling the limbs, that you are focused and your limbs are controlled and you're not moving around. Some people like to move around in their salah. Right? So it's it's necessary to be still, to have the stillness for perfection in concentration. Okay? If not, by turning the face around, one's thoughts will also stray through the string of the eyes. If you're looking around, and if your hands are moving, and if you're like shifting your, your weight, huh? all of that is going to have an, a, a, a dire effect on our own concentration and focus in our salah. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar Kabira. The last hadith of Mubarak for, for today, and you know, for this session of Ramadan, and this is our 275th hadith mubarakah that we have covered alhamdulillah only by the rahmat of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know this has been the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allowed us to cover all of this it has been related by hazrat anas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu anna nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal ya anas ij'al basaraka haythu tasjud 
that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, O Anas, direct your eyes to the point of prostration. This has been related by Bayhaqi Bay, Bay, Bay um, in his Sunan. And it is really about confining one's eyes, focus, right? It is established through just experience that one is able to acquire concentration by confining one's eyes to one spot. And this is the object of you know several different spiritual practices or ashgal as well. What do you think we do in muraqaba? We focus on a specific spot. Latifa qalb, latifa ruh, latifa sir, latifa khafi, latifa akhfa, latifa nafs, latifa qalabiya. We're focusing on specific spots. And the, this hadith of Mubarakah is a basis for these practices. Direct your eyes to the point of prostration. That you know, basaraka. That focus your 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 eyes on something, and that's what we do. We focus our internal eyes on certain points. These are called subtleties. These are called sut subtleties or lata if, meaning you can't feel them without really focusing on them. They're so subtle, right? They're not obvious. Okay, there's something with latif. Right? They, they're, they're not something that is very kathif. They're not something that is very present. It's, it's something you have to feel. And so focusing our thoughts on them, mashallah, alhamdulillah, we can start to feel the zikr of Allah within them. Allah, 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 Allah. This zikr starts to emanate from them. And we are able to listen to them with our internal ears. And we are able to feel the vibrations with our internal ears. That the zikr, you know, this vibration, this heat, just like, you know, um, vibration of a speaker, you can hear the sound of the speaker. So the vibration within, we can hear the sound, Allah, Allah, Allah. And with that zikr, there's this heat, this, this, this warmness, this warmth that we feel inside, right? And that will result in, in the, the muhabba of Allah, that the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within. So, you know, a lot of these spiritual practices are based on ahadith and, and the Qur'an as well. And alhamdulillah, we should learn what the sources of, of these ahadith are. And we should make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us, inshallah ta'ala, through the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through the practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to become a more perfect abd of Allah, a more perfect servant and slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because truly that is why we have been sent in this dunya, to be able to experience that, to become a true abd, to become a true servant, to become somebody who submits themselves completely with their heart, with their soul, with their nafs, with their aql, with their body, with all of our existence, we submit ourselves. So we make dua to Allah that on this last day, most probably the last day of Ramadan, when this dear, dear friend of ours is departing us, that inshallah ta'ala, ya Allah, make us a true abd of yours. O oh Allah, do not leave us to the trickeries of, of our own nafs and to the treacheries of shaitan, ya Allah kareem. Protect us, ya Allah kareem, with the, your most perfect protection, ya Allah kareem. And Allah, make us make us somebody that is pleasing to you. Ameen, ya Rabbul Alameen. Wa akhru dawana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Inshallah ta'ala, we will do the zikr of our heart. Close your eyes, bow your heads in humility and humbleness. Let go of all the thoughts. Step back from your thoughts. Guard your thoughts. Don't let them interfere with you. Negate everything in this dunya, everyone in this dunya, because everything and everyone is temporary. Affirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence. Our Rabb, our Malik, our Khalik, who is permanent from Azal to Abad. And make niya that Allah Ta'ala's tajalliyat and warat for you zat are descending upon me. The entering the part of my ruh which is called qalb, two fingers below my left chest. And focus your concentration on that point. And feel that this light is entering it. Feel that the light is immersing it. And your, your heart is engrossing in it. And feel that your qalb is calling out to Allah. Feel that your qalb is saying, Allah, Allah, Allah. And that you're listening to it, inshallah.
لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم شلا تلميك دعاء سبحان ربي على الوحاب اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مسرف القلوب سرف قلوبنا على تاتك الله كريم or kind and merciful Lord Allah we are so pleased with you Allah Allah we are razi with you Allah كريم Allah that you gave us this beautiful gift of Ramadan Ya Allah كريم we did not deserve it Allah you allowed us to fast for your sake Ya Allah كريم Allah we did not deserve it Allah you allowed us to read Quran listen to Quran in Taravi Allah we did not deserve it Allah, you allowed us to listen to the tafsir of Qur'an and some of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah, we did not deserve it. Allah, you allowed us to do your dhikr, ya Allah kareem, to remember you in our hearts and with our tongues, ya Allah kareem. Surely we did not deserve it, ya Allah. But you kept on giving, you kept on giving, and you kept on giving. Allah, even in dunya, people give to only those that they love, ya Allah. Allah, so that hope is within our hearts, Ya Allah, that you love us, Ya Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, Allah, your love is paramount to us, Allah. Your love is our maqsad, Ya Allah Kareem. You are beloved to us, Ya Allah. Allah, we ask that you make us beloved to you, Ya Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, truly Allah, when we look at our own amal, Allah, they were tainted, they were shortcomings, Ya Allah. They were broken amal. But Allah... Your love is supreme, Allah. Your maghfirah is supreme, Ya Allah Kareem. Your rahmat, your compassion is supreme. Allah, we are so sure about it. And we can swear by this, Ya Allah, that you will accept them, Allah. Because you are so Kareem, you're so generous, Ya Allah. Allah, that you will accept our broken amal, Ya Allah. And Allah, Allah, we have so much hope that you will give us full, full rewards for this, Ya Allah. And Allah, as that fasting is for me and I am its reward. That's all we seek, Allah. We seek you. Allah, we seek you, Ya Allah, that you become the purpose of our life. That's the center of our attention, Ya Allah Kareem, that you become somebody that we adore more than anything, Ya Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, only you matter, Ya Allah Kareem. Allah, bless us with your mahabba, Ya Allah, in these last moments of Ramadan. Allah, bless us with your mahabba, Ya Allah Kareem. Give us your ishq, ishq haqiqi, Ya Allah Kareem. Give us one drop of your love, Ya Allah. Allah, make us feel, feel the halawat of iman, the sweetness of faith when we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Every atom of our being should vibrate, Ya Allah. Ya Allah Kareem, with the zikr Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, that you protect us from a life of sin, Ya Allah, outward or inward, Ya Allah Kareem. 
all these spiritual ailments that we suffer from, these ikhlaqi ailments, Allah protect us from that. Allah, that we ask you, Ya Allah, that you forgive all of our sins that we did, Ya Allah, when we did it alone, hiding it from others. And whether we did it out in public, Allah, Allah, Ya Allah, forgive all of them. Allah, forgive all the sins that we remember and forgive all the sins that we have forgotten, Ya Allah, Kareem. O Kareem, Allah, you are the most forgiving. You love to forgive, Ya Allah, Kareem. Allah, one thing we beseech you for, Allah, today is Laylatul Jaisa. Allah, we will just, some of us will just drop, drop, Ya Allah, all our guards and fall back into sins. Allah, don't let us fall back into sin, Ya Allah, Kareem. Don't let us fall back into sin. Control our gazes and our eyes and control our tongues, control our ears, control our hearts, control our nafs, Ya Allah, Kareem. Allah, we don't want to fall back in that gutter, in that stench and the filth of sin again, Ya Allah. Protect us from shaitan, protect us from our, from our own nafs. And I know, Ya Allah, it is our fault. Ya Allah, we are the ones who go out in the chandrat and we become, Ya Allah, heedless Allah. Allah, protect us from, from being heedless Allah. You teach us that on, on Eid, you, you start your day with Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is bigger than this. Allah is more majestic than everything. Allah, 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 we ask you, Ya Allah, that you, you give us this, this, this ability to be vigilant of that, Ya Allah, that truly you are greater than anything, Allah. Allah, Allah, protect us, Allah, Kareem. Protect us from bad friends, Allah, from bad ideas, from bad gatherings, Ya Allah, Kareem. Allah, protect us all from bad ending, Ya Allah, Kareem. Allah, when our time of death comes, give us a death of, of Kalima Tayyaba and Iman. Give us a life of Iman. Taqwa, haya, and wafa, ya Allah, kareem. Give us a life of ihsan. And Allah, give us a, a death of martyrdom. And give us a death of ya Allah, kalima tayyiba, ya Allah, kareem. Oh Allah, everybody who's present here right now, who have their hands raised and, and seeking you from you, ya Allah, kareem. Allah, we ask that you bless them with your wilaya, ya Allah, kareem, with your nispa. Oh Allah, we ask, ya Allah, that you take care of all of their trials and tribulations in their life. Allah, if anybody's suffering, take their suffering away. If anybody has any du'as that Allah that they want accepted, if there's khair in them for them, Allah, Allah accept their du'as. Ya Allah, people who are doing hifs, Allah, make it easy for them. People who are becoming alim, Allah, make it easy for them. People who are giving da'wat Allah, make it easy for them. Ya Allah, Allah, we ask you that you bless this institution of Zainab Center. Allah, Allah, this is only your rahmah that you have allowed us to go this far and you have allowed this to become a bastion of guidance for others, Ya Allah. Allah, we ask that beyond our lives that you keep this institution running till the Day of Judgment and make this a source of guidance for all, Ya Allah Kareem. Only to your rahmah, Ya Allah, only to your rahmah, Ya Allah, that this chain continues, Ya Allah, this light continues from heart to heart, Ya Allah Kareem. Allah, just like we learn from so many of our mashayikh and so many of our, of our teachers and Allah they work so hard on us Allah Allah you know that the administration the teachers work so hard on the students of, of, of this of the center Ya Allah Kareem Allah we ask that you make them an embodiment of Iman and Taqwa and Haya make them strong Muslims and Muslimas Ya Allah Kareem that take your word to four corners of this dunya Ya Allah Kareem Oh Allah Make us righteous beings, Ya Allah Kareem, virtuous beings, Ya Allah. Make us into somebody that you love. Allah, look at the students of Zainab Center with love, Ya Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, we ask that you put barakah in the lives of the administration and the teachers, Ya Allah, and the students, Ya Allah. Put barakah in their risk. Allah, do not make them muhtaj of anybody. Oh Allah, make them make them ghani of everyone, Ya Allah Kareem. Give them istighna, Ya Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, we ask them, Ya Allah, that you send mercy and protect the, the, the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, especially our, our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Allah Kareem. Allah, it's been more than six months, Ya Allah, and our heart cannot take this anymore, this heartbreak. Allah, Allah, all these shuhada, over 50,000 shuhada, Ya Allah Kareem. Allah, protect our brothers and sisters, Ya Allah, our daughters and, and our mothers, Ya Allah Kareem. Oh Allah, protect their lives, protect their belongings, their homes, protect their izzah, Ya Allah Kareem, protect their home, protect their, Ya Allah, protect their iman, Ya Allah Kareem. 
O oh Allah, make the Ummah into one. Ya Allah, get rid of all the tafaraqa, Ya Allah Kareem. Make them one and strong against all these forces of evil, Ya Allah Kareem. O oh Allah, help us establish truth and, and justice as, as determined by the Sharia, Ya Allah Kareem. O oh Allah, make us people of Sharia, make us people of Hakika, Ya Allah Kareem. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, accept all our duas. When our time of death comes, Allah, make that time the most beautiful time of our lives. Allah, when we're leaving this dunya, when our ruh is exiting our body, make that the most ecstatic time of our life and the last words coming from our tongue should be La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah 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 لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله والله accept all our duas with your rahmat fazal karam alone khuda banda maqsood hai man tu e warzae tu mera mohabbat aur maarifat zauq ko shauq khud bid de sallallahu taala ala khair khalqihi muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin amin ya rabbal alamin Jazakumullah khair wa ahsan jazafi darim. I seek your forgiveness for any mistakes that I've made. And if I said something or done something that may have hurt your heart, for the sake of Allah Ta'ala and for the sake of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are all ummati of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Please forgive me and my children and my family. And inshallah Ta'ala, keep each other in your duas, inshallah Ta'ala. Ramadan is not the end of our journey. It is a beginning of a new journey. And may Allah Ta'ala make it an easy one in which we we continue to please him inshallah we stay on guidance and we help support each other on this path inshallah jazakumullah khair wa ahsan jazaa fi darin assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh this session is no longer being recorded goodbye